from Augsburg. The emperor went to the camp before Ulm and made arrangements for assaulting that place. At a short distance from the city's terrible and stubborn combat took place between the French and the Austrians and had lasted two hours when shouts of long live the emperor were suddenly heard. This name, which always carried terror to the enemy's ranks and courage to our own, electrified the soldiers to such a point that they routed the Austrians. The emperor showed himself in the front line, shouting, forward, and beckoning to the soldiers to advance. From time to time, his horse vanished in cannon smoke. During this furious charge, the emperor found himself near a badly wounded grenadier. Like the others, the brave fellow was shouting, forward, forward. The emperor approached and throwing him his military cloak said, try and bring it back to me. I will give you the cross. You have just won in exchange for it. The grenadier, feeling himself mortally wounded, replied that the shroud he had just received was as good as a decoration and expired wrapped in the imperial mantle. When the combat was over, the emperor had the grenadier, who was a veteran of the army of Egypt, lifted up and caused him to be buried in this cloak. Another soldier, not less courageous than the one of whom I have just spoken, also received marks of honor from his majesty on the day following the fight before Ulm. While the emperor was visiting the ambulances, a cannoneer of light infantry who had but one thigh, who was lustily shouting, Love of the emperor, attracted his attention. He approached the soldier and said, Is that all you have to say to me? No, sire, I can inform you that I dismounted four pieces of Austrian cannon all alone, and it is the pleasure of seeing them defeated that makes me forget that I shall soon shut my eyes forever. The emperor, moved by such firmness, gave his cross to the cannoneer took the name of his parents and said to him, if you get over this, you go to the Hotel des Invalides. Thanks, sire, but I have bled too much. My board will not cost you very dear. I see that I shall have to come off guard, but long live the emperor all the same. Unfortunately, this brave man knew his condition, but too well. He did not survive the amputation of his thigh. We followed the emperor to Ulm after the occupation of the place. And we saw an army of more than 30,000 men lay down their arms at the feet of his majesty while defiling before him. I have never seen anything more imposing than this spectacle. The emperor was on horseback a few paces in front of his staff. His countenance was calm and grave. Yet in spite of himself, his glance betrayed his joy. He was constantly lifting his hat to return the salutes of the superior officers of the Austrian division. When the imperial guard entered Augsburg, Eighty grenadiers marched at the head of the columns, each carrying an enemy's flag. On arriving at Munich, the emperor was received with the greatest attentions by his ally, the Elector of Bavaria. His majesty went several times to the play and the chase and gave a concert to the ladies of the court. As has since been learned, it was during this stay of the emperor at Munich that the emperor Alexander and the king of Prussia promised each other at Potsdam over the tomb of Frederick the second to unite their efforts against his majesty. A year later, the Emperor Napoleon likewise made a visit to the tomb of the great Frederick. The taking of Ulm completed the defeat of the Austrians and opened the gates of Vienna to the emperor, but the Russians advanced by forced marches to the relief of their allies. His majesty went to meet them, and on December 1st, the two armies found themselves face to face. By one of those chances peculiar to the emperor, the date of this Battle of Austerlitz was also that of his coronation. I do not know why there was no tent at Austerlitz for the emperor. The soldiers made a sort of barrack for him out of branches with an opening in the top for the smoke to escape. For his bed, the emperor had nothing but straw, but he was so fatigued on the eve of the battle after passing the day on horseback on the heights of Sinton that he was sleeping profoundly when General Severi, one of his aides de camp, entered to give him an account of a mission of which he had been charged. The general was obliged to touch his shoulder and push him in order to rouse him. Then he rose and remounted his horse to visit the outposts. The night was dark, but the camp was suddenly illuminated, as if by enchantment. Each soldier put a handful of straw on the end of his bayonet, and all these brands were lighted. In less time than it takes to write it, the emperor went through all the lines on horseback, speaking to the soldiers whom he recognized. Tomorrow, my heroes, he said to them, be what you have always been, and the Russians are ours, and we shall keep them. 
The air resounded with cries of long live the emperor, and there was neither officer nor soldier who did not count upon the morrow for a victory. His Majesty, when visiting the line of attack, where provisions had been lacking for 48 hours, a loaf of soldiers bread to each eight men, being all that had been distributed that day, saw as he passed from bivouac to bivouac the soldiers roasting potatoes in the ashes, coming up to the first regiment of the line, of which his brother was colonel. The emperor said to a grenadier of the 2nd Battalion, taking and eating one of the potatoes of the squad as he did so. Are you content with these pigeons? Hmm. They are always better than nothing, but such pigeons are certainly better Lenten diet. Well, old fellow, returned his majesty, pointing to the fires of the enemy, help me to oust those beat yonder, and we shall spend Shrove Tuesday in Vienna. The emperor came back, lay down again, and slept until three o'clock in the morning. The servants were assembled around a bivouac fire near his majesty's barrack. We were lying on the ground, wrapped in our cloaks, for the night was very cold. I had not closed my eyes in four days and was beginning to drowse when, towards three o'clock, the emperor sent to ask me for some punch. I would have given the whole Austrian empire for another hour's sleep. I carried his majesty the punch, which I made by the bivouac fire. The emperor made Marshal Berthier take some, and I shared the rest with the attendants. Between four and five o'clock, the emperor ordered the first movements of his army. In a few moments, everybody was afoot, each at his post. Aides de camp and orderlies could be seen galloping in all directions, and the battle opened at daybreak. I shall enter into no details of this glorious day, which, according to the emperor's own expression, terminated the campaign by a thunderstroke. Not one of His Majesty's combinations was a failure, and in a few hours the French were masters of the field of battle and of Germany entire. The brave General Rapp was wounded at Austerlitz, as in every other battle in which he figured he was taken to the chateau of Austerlitz, and in the evening the Emperor went to see him and chatted with him for some time. His Majesty spent the night in the chateau. Two days later the Emperor Francis came to seek His Majesty and ask for peace. Before the end of December... A treaty was concluded by which the Elector of Bavaria and the Duke of Württemberg, the faithful allies of the Emperor Napoleon, were created kings. In return for this elevation, which was due solely to him, His Majesty asked and obtained for Prince Eugène, Viceroy of Italy, the hand of the Princess Auguste Emily of Bavaria. During a stay in Vienna, the Emperor had established his headquarters at Schönbrunn, which afterwards became celebrated by several soldiers of His Majesty, which they say is now, by a singular destiny, the residence of his son. I cannot be positive that it was during his first day at Schönbrunn that the extraordinary meeting took place, which I am about to relate. His Majesty, dressed as a colonel of the Chesters of the Guard, rode on horseback every day. One morning while on the Vienna road, he saw an open carriage approaching in which were an ecclesiastic and a woman bathed in tears whom he did not recognize. Drawing near the carriage, Napoleon saluted this lady and inquired the cause of her grief and the object of her journey. Sir, said she, I live in a village two leagues from here in a house which has been pillaged by soldiers and my gardener has been killed. I have come to ask a safeguard from your emperor who has known my family very well and is under great obligations to it. What is your name, madame? De Bonny. I am the daughter of Monsieur de Marbeuf, former governor of Corsica. I am delighted, madame, returned Napoleon, to find an occasion of being agreeable to you. I am the emperor. Madame de Bonny was dumbfounded. Napoleon reassured her and rode on, first begging her to go to his headquarters and wait for him. On his return, he received her, treated her wonderfully well, gave her a detachment of the guard chasseurs for escort and dismissed her happy and contented. As soon as the Battle of Austerlitz had been won, the Emperor made haste to send Moustache, the courier, to France to announce the tidings of the Empress. Her Majesty was at the Chateau of saint Cloud. It was nine o'clock in the evening when loud shouts of joy and the noise of a horse arriving at a gallop were suddenly heard. The sound of bells and the repeated cracking of a whip announced a courier. The Empress, who was awaiting news from the army with keen impatience, rushed to the window and flung it open. The words victory in Austerlitz struck her ear. Impatient to know the details, she went down to the front steps, followed by her ladies. Moustache gave her a verbal account of the great news and handed her the Emperor's letter. After reading it, Josephine drew a superb diamond ring from her finger and gave it to the courier. 
poor mustache had covered more than 50 leagues at a gallop that day, and he was so worn out that he had to be lifted from his horse. It took four persons to perform this operation and carry him to bed. His last horse, which had doubtless been less well cared for than the others, fell dead in the court of the chateau. Chapter 10. Having left Stuttgart, the emperor stopped only 24 hours at Karlsruhe and 48 from... Strasbourg. From there to Paris, he made only very short halts, though he neither hurried himself nor demanded from the postillions that extreme speed which he was accustomed to require. While we were ascending the hill of Mo, the emperor himself deeply engrossed in a book he was reading, not paying any attention to what was passing on his route, a young girl caught hold of the door of his majesty's carriage and clung to it, in spite of the efforts feeble enough, in point of fact, made by the cavalry... Calvary, <laughs> cavaliers of the escort to detach her and opening it sprang inside all this was done in less time than it takes me to describe it the emperor inexpressibly surprised cried what the devil does this mad woman want of me then recognizing the, the young girl after examining her features more attentively he added with marked ill humor ah it is you again will you never leave me in peace the young girl not frightened by this rude reception yet not without shedding many tears said that the only favor she came to implore for her father was that his prison should be changed and that he should be taken from the chateau diff where the dampness was ruining his health to the citadel of strasbourg no no cried the emperor don't think of it i have a good many other things to do besides receiving your visits if i should grant you this request also in a week you would have imagined another the poor damsel insisted with a firmness worthy of a better success, but the emperor was inflexible. On reaching the summit of the hill, he said to the young girl, I hope you mean to get out now and leave me to finish my journey. I'm very sorry, but what you ask is impossible. And he dismissed her without listening to anything further. While this was going on, I was climbing the hill on foot a few paces from the carriage of his majesty. And when this disagreeable scene was over and the young person obliged to depart without having gained anything, passed sobbing in front of me, I recognized Mademoiselle de la Cholet, whom I had already seen in similar circumstances, but when her courageous affection for her parents had obtained a better result. General de la Cholet had been arrested together with all his family on the 18th through the door, 5th of September. After having been subjected to a detention of 28 months, he had been tried at Strasbourg by a council of war on an order given by the first consul and unanimously acquitted later on in the conspiracy of generals Pichigrou Moreau, George Cadoodle, and Messieurs de Polignac de Riviere etc. was discovered General de la Jolet, who was concerned in it, was condemned to death with them. His wife and daughter were transferred to Paris by the gendarmerie. Madame de la Jolet was placed in the closest confinement, and her daughter, separated from her, took shelter with some friends of the family. It was at this time that the young girl, hardly 14 as yet, displayed a courage and strength of character beyond her years. When she learned that her father had been condemned to death without acquainting anyone with her resolution, she set off alone on foot without a guide or introduced her at four o'clock in the morning and presented herself all in tears at the Chateau St. Cloud, where the emperor was. She found great difficulty in getting in, but she would not allow herself to be hindered by any obstacle and made her way to me. Sir, said she, I have been promised that you would conduct me at once to the emperor. I do not know who had told her this tale. I ask you no other favor. Do not refuse it. I entreat you. Touched by her confidence and her despair, I went to tell her majesty the empress. She, although greatly moved by the resolution and the tears of a child so young, nevertheless did not dare to lend her aid at once, lest she should rekindle the wrath of the emperor, which was very great against those who had been implicated in the conspiracy. The empress ordered me to say to the young de la Jolie that she was grieved to be unable to do anything for her at the moment, but that she must return to St. Cloud at five o'clock the next morning, and that she and Queen Hortense would find some means to give her access to the emperor. The young girl came back the next day at the appointed hour. Her Majesty the Empress had her placed in the green salon. There, during ten hours, she watched for the moment when the emperor, coming from his council, would pass through this room to go to his cabinet. The empress and her august daughter gave orders to have her served with breakfast and dinner. They even came themselves to beg her to take some nourishment, but their efforts were fruitless. The poor child had no other need nor thought than that of obtaining her father's life. At five o'clock in the afternoon, the emperor at last appeared. 
Someone made a sign to Mademoiselle de la Jolie to show her which was the emperor, and she sprang towards him. He was surrounded by several state officials and officers of his household. A heartbreaking scene ensued, which lasted for some time. The young girl dragged herself at the emperor's knees, imploring him with clasped hands and in the most touching accents to pardon her father the emperor began by repulsing her saying in the severest tone your father is a traitor this is the second time he has been guilty toward the state i can grant you nothing to this outburst of his majesty mademoiselle de la Jolie responded the first time my father was tried and declared innocent this time it is it is his pardon which i implore at last, the emperor, overcome by such courage and devotion, and a little wearied, besides, by a seance, which the perseverance of the young girl seemed inclined to prolong still further, yielded to her prayers, and the life of General de la Jolet was spared. Worn out with fatigue and hunger, his daughter fell unconscious at the feet of the emperor. He raised her himself, had her care for, and presenting her to those who had witnessed the scene, he praised her filial piety. His majesty at once gave orders to have her taken back to Paris, and several superior officers disputed the privilege of accompanying her. Generals Wolf, aide-de-camp of Prince Louis, and La Valette were deputed for this purpose, and they took to her father at the conciergerie on entering his dungeon she threw herself on his neck to announce the pardon she had just extorted but overwhelmed by so many emotions she was unable to pronounce a single word and it was general lavalette who told the prisoner what he owed to the courageous persistence of his daughter the next day she obtained through the empress josephine the liberty of her mother who was to have been transported after having obtained the life of her father and the liberty of her mother, as I have just related, Mademoiselle de la Jolie wished also to try and save their unfortunate companions, who had been condemned to death. She joined the Breton ladies, whom the success she had already gained induced to seek her assistance, and she hastened with them to Malmaison to ask renewed favors. The ladies had succeeded in having the execution of the condemned deferred, for two hours, they hoped that the Empress Josephine might induce the Emperor to relent, but he was inflexible, and this generous attempt was unsuccessful. Mademoiselle de la Jolie returned to Paris, grieved to have been unable to wrest a few more unhappy persons from the rigors of the law. I have already said two things, which I feel obliged to repeat in this space. The first is that, far from binding myself to relate events in their chronological order, I will write them down as they occur to my memory. The second is that I consider it as an obligation and a duty to recount all the actions of the emperor which may serve to make him better known and which may have been forgotten either involuntarily or of a set purpose by those who have written his life. I rather fear to be accused of monotony on this point and reproached with making nothing but a panegyric. But if that should happen, I would say so much the worse for those who tire of the recital good actions. I have undertaken to tell the truth about the emperor, whether good or bad. Any reader who expects nothing that is not bad, considering his majesty in my memoirs, like him, who should expect to find nothing but good, would do well to go no further, for I have determined to tell all I know. I am not to be blamed if the benefits conferred by the emperor have been so numerous that my recitals must often turn to his praise. I have thought it well to make these Brief remarks before relating another pardon granted by His Majesty at the time of his coronation, and of which the adventure of Mademoiselle de la Jolie has reminded me. On the day when the first distribution of the decorations of the Legion of Honor took place in the Church of the Invalid, and just as the emperor was about to withdraw at the close of his imposing ceremony, a very young man threw himself on his knees on the steps of the throne, crying, Pardon, pardon for my father! Touched by his interesting face and his profound emotion, his majesty approached and tried to raise him. But the youth, refusing to change his attitude, only repeated his request in a tone of supplication. What is your father's name? inquired the emperor. Sire, replied the young man, hardly able to make himself heard. He has made it but too well known, and his enemies have greatly calumniated him to your majesty. But I swear that he's innocent. I am the son of Oog de Strim. 
Sir, your father is gravely compromised by his connection with the incorrigible factions, but I will attend to your request. Mr. Destrem is fortunate in having a son so devoted to him. His Majesty added a few more consoling words, and the youth withdrew with the certainty that his father would be pardoned. Unfortunately, the pardon arrived too late. Mr. Ux Destrem had been transported to the Isle of Oleron after the attempt of the 3rd Nivos, 24th December, in which, however, he had taken no part, died in exile without learning that the solicitations of his son had obtained entire success. On our return from the glorious campaign of Austerlitz, the commune of St. Clou, which had been greatly benefited by the sojourn of the court, decided to distinguish itself on this occasion by manifesting its affection for the emperor. The mayor of St. Clou was Mr. Beret, a man of excellent education and much goodness. He was particularly esteemed by Napoleon, who was fond of conversing with him. Hence, he was sincerely regretted by his fellow citizens when he was removed from them by death. Monsieur Beret had erected a triumphal arch of very simple construction, yet noble and in good taste, at the foot of the avenue leading to the palace, and adorned it with the following inscription, To its beloved sovereign, the happiest of communes. On the evening when the emperor was expected, the mayor and his assistants with the obligatory harangue spent part of the night at the foot of this monument. But, being old and a valedictorian, Monsieur Beret at last retired, but not without placing one of his fellow citizens as a sentry charged to apprise him of the arrival of the first courier. A ladder was stretched across the triumphal arch so that no one should pass under it before his majesty. Unfortunately... The municipal Argus fell asleep. The emperor came in the morning and passed besides the arch, laughing a good deal at the obstacle which prevented him from enjoying the signal honor intended for him by the worthy people of St. Cloud. That same day, a little sketch made the rounds of the palace representing the authority sleeping besides the monument. The ladder that barred the passage was not omitted, and below it was the inscription, Lark Barre, a pun on the name of the mayor. The inscription had been travestied in this fashion to its beloved sovereign, the sleepiest of communes. Their majesties were much amused by this pleasantry. While the court was at St. Cloud, the emperor, having worked very late with Monsieur de Talleyrand, invited him to sleep at the chateau. The prince, who preferred to return to Paris, refused, alleging an excuse that the beds had a very disagreeable odor. There was nothing in it. However, for as may readily be believed, the greatest care was taken of the furniture and the bedding in all the imperial palaces. The motive assigned by Monsieur de Talleyrand had been given at random. He might just as well have offered another. Nevertheless, the observation struck the emperor, and that evening on entering his chamber, he complained that his bed smelled bad. I assured him to the contrary and promised his majesty to convince him of the mistake on the following day. But far from being persuaded, on rising, the emperor repeated that his bed had a very disagreeable odor and positively must be changed. Monsieur Charvet was immediately summoned to whom his majesty complained of his bed and ordered another to be brought. Monsieur Desmassy, keeper of the spare furniture, was also sent for. He examined the mattresses, feather beds, and coverlets, turning them over and over. Others did the same, and all remained convinced that the bed had no odor whatsoever. In spite of so many testimonies, the emperor, not because he was unwilling to have his statements proved incorrect, but solely through a whimsicality to which he was rather subject, persisted in his first notion and insisted that his bed should be changed. Seeing that he must be obeyed, I sent it to the Tuileries and had the Paris bed brought to the Chateau of St. Cloud. The emperor was pleased with this alteration. And when he went back to the Tuileries, he did not perceive the change, but found his bed in that Chateau very good. The most amusing thing about it all was that the ladies of the palace, on learning that the emperor had complained of his bed, likewise found an insupportable odor in theirs. Everything had to be turned upside down, and a small revolution was a result. The caprices of sovereigns are frequently epidemic. Chapter 11. His Majesty used to say that one could recognize an honest man by his conduct towards his wife, his children, and his servants. And I hope that these memoirs will show that the emperor in these different relations acted like an honest man, such as he defined him. He also said that the most dangerous vice in a sovereign was immorality because he was a law to subjects. What he meant by immorality was, without doubt, a scandalous publicity given to liaisons, which should always be kept secret. For as to these liaisons themselves, he repelled them no more than 
other people when they were thrown in his way. Anyone else perhaps in the same position surrounded by seductions, attacks, and advances of every description would have resisted temptation less frequently. God forbid, however, that I should undertake to defend his majesty on his this head. I will even grant, if you like, that his conduct was not always in perfect accord with the moral of his discourses, but you must also grant that it was a good deal for a sovereign to take the greatest pains to hide his distractions from the public to whom they might have been, a subject of scandal or still worse of imitation, and from his wife to whom they would have occasioned violent grief. On this head, I will give two or three anecdotes which just now occur to me, and which belong, I think, or nearly so, to the period at which my narrative has arrived. The Empress Josephine was jealous, and notwithstanding the prudence with which the Emperor conducted his secret liaisons, she was sometimes aware of what was going on. At Genoa, the Emperor had known Madame Gazzani, the daughter of an Italian dancer, and he continued to receive her at Paris. One day, when he had an appointment with his dame in the little apartments, he ordered me to remain in his chamber and to tell everybody who came to ask for him, even the Empress herself, that he was working in his cabinet with a minister. The interview took place in the apartment formerly occupied by Mr. de Burienne, which communicated by a staircase with His Majesty's bedchamber. This apartment was very simply arranged and decorated. It had a second exit on what was called the dark staircase because it was very badly lighted. Madame Gazzani entered by it while the emperor went to meet her by the other one. They had been together but a few minutes when the empress came into the emperor's chamber and asked me what her husband was doing. Madame, the emperor is much occupied at this moment. He's working his cabinet with the minister. Constant, I wish to go in. That is impossible, madame. I received formal orders not to disturb his majesty, not even for her majesty, the empress. Thereupon, the latter turned away dissatisfied and even angry. At the end of half an hour, she came back, and as she renewed her request, I was obliged to renew my response. I was distressed to see her majesty's chagrin, but I could not disobey my orders. That same evening, at his couche, the empress said to me in a severe tone that the empress assured him that when she came to ask for him, I had told her that he was shut up with a lady. Without disturbing myself, I replied to the emperor that he certainly could not believe that. No, replied the emperor, returning to the amicable tone with which he usually honored me. I know you well enough to be assured of your discretion, but woe to the fools who gossip if I succeed in discovering them. At the couche of the next day, the empress entered just as the emperor was getting into bed, and his majesty said to her before me, It is very wrong, Josephine, to attribute lies to this poor Constant. He is not the man to tell you such a story as you have brought to me. The empress sat down on the side of the bed, began to laugh, and put her pretty little hand on her husband's mouth. As I was in question, I withdrew. During several days, her majesty was cold and severe toward me. But as that was not natural to her, she soon resumed that air of kindliness, which won her all hearts. As to the emperor's liaison with Madame Gazzani, it lasted nearly a year, but their meetings were by no means frequent. The following trait of jealousy is not so personal to me as the one I have just cited. Madame de R, wife of one of the prefects of the palace and one of her ladies of honor, whom the empress most preferred, found her all in tears and deep affliction one evening. Madame de R waited in silence until Her Majesty should deign to inform her of the cause of this violent grief. She did not wait long. Hardly had she entered the salon when Her Majesty exclaimed, I am sure that he is with a woman now. My dear friend, added she, continue to weep. Take this light and let us go and listen to his door. We shall hear. Madame de R did all she could to dissuade her from this project. She represented to her the lateness of the hour, the darkness of the passage, the danger they would incur of being surprised, but all in vain. Her Majesty put the light in her hand, saying, You absolutely must accompany me. If you are afraid, I will go first. Madame de R obeyed, and the two ladies tiptoed through the corridor by the light of a single candle, swayed about by the wind. On reaching the door of the Emperor's antechamber, they paused, hardly daring to breathe, and the Empress softly turned the handle. But just as they set foot in the apartment, Rustam, who lay there and who was fast asleep, gave vent to a formidable and prolonged snore. Apparently, the ladies had not expected to find him there, and Madame de R, imagining she saw him springing out of the foot of the bed, saber and pistol in hand, turned and ran as fast as possible, still holding her candle towards the apartment of the Empress, leading the latter in complete darkness. 
She did not get her breath until she was in the Empress's bedchamber, and it was not until then that she remembered that she had left her without light in the corridor. Madame de R was about to go to meet her when she saw her coming back, holding her sides with laughter and her grief entirely consoled by this burlesque adventure. Madame de R tried to excuse herself. My dear, said Her Majesty, you merely anticipated me. That booby of a Rustam frightened me so much that I would have set you the example of flight if you had not been still more of a poltroon than I. I do not know what these ladies would have discovered if their courage had not failed before they reached the end of their expedition. Nothing at all, perhaps, for the Emperor seldom received at the Tuileries the person with whom he was smitten for the moment. As has been seen under the consulate, he gave his rendezvous in a little house in the Allée des Veuves. As emperor, his amorous interviews likewise took place outside the chateau. He went to them disguised and by night and exposed himself to all the risks of a lady killer. One evening, between 11 o'clock and midnight, the emperor sent for me, asked for a black coat and a round hat, and bade me follow him. We got into a black carriage, Prince Mira making a third in the party as Caesar driving. There was but one lackey to open the door, and neither of the men was in livery. After riding about Paris a little, the emperor stopped the carriage in the Rue de Blanc. He alighted, took a few steps forward, knocked at a gate, and entered the house alone. The prince and I remained in the carriage. Hours passed, and we began to be uneasy. The life of the emperor had been threatened off enough to make it natural that we should fear some new snare or some surprise. The imagination goes fast when it is pursued by such alarms. Prince Murat cursed and swore energetically, sometimes at the imprudence of his majesty, sometimes at his gallantry, and sometimes at the lady in her complacence. I was not more at ease than he, but being calmer, I tried to quiet him. At last, being no longer able to conquer his impatience, the prince sprang out of the carriage. I followed him, and he had his hand on the knocker of the door when the emperor emerged from it. The prince acquainted him with our uneasiness and the reflections we had made on his temerity. What childishness, said his majesty thereupon. What was there to be so much afraid about? Wherever I am, am I not at home? It was entirely of their own accord that certain habitués of the court took pains to mention to the emperor young and pretty persons who wished to make his acquaintance, for it was not in his character to give any such commissions. I was not enough of a grand lord to find such employment honorable. Hence, I would never meddle with affairs of the sort. That, however, was not for lack of having been indirectly sounded or even openly solicited by certain ladies who aspired to the title favorites, although that title gave few rights or privileges with the emperor. But I say again, I would not enter into such proceedings. I contented myself with the duties imposed by my place, not with other things. And although his majesty took pleasure in reviving the usages of the old monarchy, the secret functions of the first valet de chambre were not reestablished, and I took care not to claim them. Plenty of others, not the ladies de chambre, were less scrupulous than I. General L., spoke one day to the emperor of a very pretty damsel whose mother kept a gaming house and who wished to be presented to him. The emperor received her only once, a few days after she was married. Some time later, the emperor wished to see her again and sent for her, but the young woman responded that she no longer belonged to herself, and she refused all the entreaties and offers that were made her. The emperor did not seem at all dissatisfied about it. On the contrary, he praised Madame D for her fidelity to her duties and strongly approved of her conduct. In 1804, the Imperial Highness, the Princess Mira, had a young reader, Mademoiselle E, in her service. She was tall, slender, well-made, a brunette with beautiful black eyes, lively and very coquettish, and possibly between 17 and 18 years old. Several persons who thought it would be to their interest to estrange His Majesty from the Empress, his wife, remarked with pleasure the reader's inclination to try the power of her glances on the emperor and that of the latter to let himself be caught by them. They fed the fire adroitly, and it was one of them that undertook the entire diplomacy of this affair. Certain propositions made by a third party were at once accepted. The fair E came to the chateau in secret, but rarely, and never spent more than two or three hours there. She became pregnant. The emperor had a house hired for her in the Rue Chateau where she was delivered of a fine boy who was endowed at birth with an income 
of 30,000 francs. He was at first confided to the care of Madame L., the nurse of Prince Achille Murat, who kept him three or four years afterwards. Monsieur M., his majesty's secretary, was charged to provide for the education of this child. When the emperor returned from the island of Elba, the son of Mademoiselle E. was entrusted to her majesty, the empress mother. The emperor's connection with Mademoiselle E. did not last long. One day she came with her mother to Fontainebleau, where the court was. She went up to his majesty's apartment and asked me to announce her. The emperor was extremely displeased with this proceeding and sent me to say to Mademoiselle E. on his part that he forbade her ever to present herself before him without his position and to stay a single moment longer at Fontainebleau. In spite of the severity to the mother, the emperor tenderly loved the son. I often fetched him to him. He would caress and give him a hundred delicacies and was much amused by his vivacity and his repartees, which were very witty for his age. This child and that of the beautiful Pole, of whom I will speak later on, are with the king of Rome, the only children the emperor had. He never had any daughters, and I think he would not have liked to have any. I have seen, I do not know where, that the emperor, during the longest stay we made in Bologna, reposed himself at night from the fatigues of the day with a beautiful Italian. Here is what I know of this adventure. While I was dressing his majesty one morning in the presence of Prince Murat, his majesty complained of seeing none but moustached faces, which said he was very depressing. The prince, always ready to offer his services to his brother-in-law on such occasions, mentioned a very beautiful and witty Genoese lady who had the greatest desire to see his majesty. The emperor laughingly accorded a tete-a-tete, and the prince undertook to deliver the message. In two days, by his means, the fair dame had arrived and was installed in the upper town. The emperor, who was living at pont de Brique, one evening ordered me to take a carriage and go for the protege of Prince Murat. I obeyed and brought back with me the beautiful Genoese, who, to avoid scandal, although it was nighttime, was introduced through a small garden situated by... High in his majesty's apartments. The poor woman was very much moved and was crying, but she was promptly consoled on seeing that she was welcome. The interview was prolonged until three o'clock in the morning when I was called to take the lady back. She returned four or five times and saw the emperor again at Rambouillet. She was good, simple, not at all intriguing, and never tried to derive any advantage from a liaison, which, after all, was only transient. Another of these favorites of a moment who precipitated herself, one might say, into the emperor's arms without giving him time to offer her his attentions was Mademoiselle L.B., a very pretty creature. She possessed intelligence and a good heart, and if she had received a less frivolous education, might doubtless have been an estimable woman. But I have every reason to think that her mother had always had the purpose of securing a protector for her second husband by utilizing the youth and beauty of the daughter of the first one. I do not recall his name, but he was of a noble family, a fact on which both mother and daughter greatly congratulated themselves. The young person was a good musician and sang agreeably, but what seemed to me as ridiculous as it was indecent was to see her in the presence of a rather large company assembled at the house of her mother, dance ballet dances in a costume almost as airy as those of the opera with castanets or a tambourine and terminated her performances by a rehearsal of attitudes and graces with such an education she should have found her position quite natural hence she was much chagrined by the short duration of her liaison with the emperor as for the mother she was in despair about it and she said to me with revolting naivete look at my poor lise what a feverish color she has it comes from her vexation at seeing herself neglected poor child you would be so good if you could have her sent for again to provoke an interview of which mother and daughter were so desirous they both came to the chapel of saint clue where during the mass the poor lise was ogling the emperor in a way that made the young woman that saw it blush. This was all time lost, and the emperor paid no attention to it.